Welcome to On Contact. We're in Cambridge, Massachusetts to speak to Professor Noam Chomsky. Has there ever been an organization in history which has dedicated itself to destruction of the possibility of organized human life? That's actually what we're facing. On Contact with Chris Hedges. Noam Chomsky is probably America's greatest intellectual who has written on the Palestine-Israel conflict, the nature of the liberal class in a capitalist democracy, how imperialism works, as well as the reconfiguration of the American economy into an oligarchic system that makes war on the middle class. This is part one of our conversation with Professor Chomsky in his office at MIT. On Contact with Chris Hedges. So Professor Chomsky, I wanted to ask you about the 10 principles that are laid out or have been organized in the book Requiem for the American Dream, which was based on the documentary that you did, the 10 principles of concentration of wealth and power. And the first one you talk about is reducing democracy. What do you mean by that? Uh, I should first comment that the uh a construction of the Ten Principles is really the contribution of the editors. It's their quite effective consolidation of hours and hours of interviews and discussions, which they organized in this form. Reducing democracy means uh, the gradual marginalization of the population, the uh, reduction of the role of the general population in decision making in the public arena. Uh, which is uh, an expected and uh, predictable consequence of the introduction of uh, the transition to neoliberal principles in the 70s and onward. Uh, there's basically two general phases of post-war U.S. Uh, socioeconomic history. The first phase was sometimes called regulated capitalism or embedded liberalism of the 50s and 60s, a very high growth period, uh, egalitarian growth, uh, some moves towards social justice in the 60s, a uh, substantial increase in democratic participation. People became really engaged in the public arena. Uh, all of this uh, had various effects. One effect was reduction, the falling rate of profit, which is critical. Uh, second effect was uh, people were becoming too, too, in, too inv engaged in uh, public affairs. This is what Samuel Huntington called an excess of democracy. An excess of democracy. And in fact, two very important uh, uh, publications came out in the early 70s, uh, both directed to this. They're interesting because they were at opposite ends of the political spectrum, but they basically came to the same conclusion with somewhat different rhetorical styles. Uh, one was the Powell Memorandum, Justice Powell yeah. Memorandum, which uh, uh, written by the late uh, uh, a, a corporate lawyer working for the tobacco corporations and so on, later became Supreme Court Justice under Nixon. Uh, he wrote a memorandum which was supposed to be confidential, but it leaked to the uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce business group, and in which he, uh, the rhetoric is quite fascinating. He uh, expressed the view of, which is not uncommon among those who really own the world, that uh, their control is being very slightly uh, diminished, and in the manner of a spoiled three-year-old who doesn't get a piece of candy, that means the world's coming to an end. So you really have to read the rhetoric to appreciate it's it. It's the attack on the American free enterprise uh, system. He said the business world is under severe attack, right. uh, led by Ralph Nader and Herbert Marcuse. In the universities, and, uh, right. <laughs> and uh, we're practically barely surviving, you know, attack on all of everything in significant in American life. And then, then he says, well, look, after all, we businessmen basically own everything. Uh, we can. We are the trustees of the universities. We don't let these, don't have to let these kids run wild and become. We, we can constrain the media. After all, we have the power. And 
calls for mobilization of the business world to defend ourselves before But became we, the blueprint, I mean, for this corporate money, the Heritage Foundation. Uh, yeah, it led to, had a big impact uh, on the growth of uh, right-wing think tanks, uh, much of the ideology of the far right. So that's at the right end of the spectrum. Then you go to the other end of the spectrum, uh, basically Carter administration liberalism. In fact, uh, the people who staffed the Carter administration Trilateral Commission. It's industrial democracies, Europe, Japan, the United States, basically uh, liberal internationalists. And they uh, have a publication called The Crisis of Democracy. And the crisis of democracy is there's too much democracy. In the 1960s, uh, too many people who are usually passive and apathetic, the way people are supposed to be, uh, started becoming engaged in the political arena, pressing for their demands and so on, uh, some, what are sometimes called special interests, meaning young people, uh, old people, uh, farmers, uh, workers, in other words, everybody, except the corporate sector, which is not mentioned. They're the national interest. But these special interests are putting too much pressure on the state, so we have to have more moderation in democracy. Uh, people have to return to being passive and apathetic. The American rapporteur who you mentioned, Sam Huntington, uh, uh, with some nostalgia referred to the period when, as he put it, Truman was able to run the country with the cooperation of a few Wall Street lawyers and executives. And then there was no crisis of democracy. That's kind of the way And they, they, they very effectively, of course, succeeded in rolling back. I want to go on to your next point about shaping ideology, but you uh, talk about the difference between Madison and Aristotle, in that Aristotle, you know, both of them understood that if there was inequality, in the same way that John Locke and Bentham and others did, that uh, there would be tension between the rich and the poor. Madison calling for government to reduce democracy, Aristotle saying the solution which you obviously support is to reduce inequality. Yeah. Your second point, shaping the ideology. The, we mentioned the Powell memo. We mentioned the Trilateral Commission. But specifically, the, they targeted uh, various segments of the society, indoctrination of the young. You talk about the way they actually created architectural plans for colleges so that large demonstrations would not be possible. The use of student debt for debt peonage, the destruction of public institutions. Talk about that process to reconfigure the ideology into a form of neoliberalism. Actually, I don't want to suggest that uh, the Trilateral Commission led to these developments. It was more or less an articulation of the liberal elite consensus on these issues. And for that reason, it's quite interesting. So the phrase indoctrination of the young actually is their phrase. Uh, the, their, their consensus phrase. They said the institutions responsible for the indoctrination of the young are failing their duty. Well, that's an interesting way to, to describe educational institutions. It's kind of like the nostalgic comment on Truman being able to run the country with corporate, a few corporate lawyers and so on. But that's kind of the ideal. There should be indoctrination. Uh, students should not be uh, free to uh, uh, think, they don't put it this way, but what it means is they shouldn't be free to inquire, to think, to challenge, uh, just the kind of things that in a decent educational system uh, young people would be encouraged to do in the, in the schools and universities. But it's dangerous because they're questioning too many eternal verities, including uh, that uh, a, that there has to be elite domination and control. This is expressed all through the history of How successful thought. do you think, looking back, that they, they were? How successful? Well, it, it's not, as I say, they were expressing the, they were articulating a consensus that led to many developments, and it's been reasonably successful. So, for example, take the uh, a kind of a business model began to be imposed on uh, colleges and universities. There's been a tremendous growth of bureaucracy. Uh, 
tilting the balance from faculty control to bureaucratic control. There's, uh, uh, there's been, a, of course, sharp raise in tuition, which is, has a very strong disciplinary effect. In the 1960s, a young person could say, OK, I'm going to take off a year and get involved in the anti-war movement and, or the you know, feminist movement or something. Then I'll come back and continue my life. You can't do that if you have a burden of debt over your head. If you come out of law school thinking, I'd love to be a public interest lawyer, but I have to pay off uh, $200,000 in debt, you just have to go to a corporate law firm and get absorbed into that culture. And in many different ways, there are disciplinary effects imposed. Uh, cutback of uh, st uh, state funding for state colleges, for example, has been very sharp. You, you also talk about how suddenly critics of American empire or American capitalism got tarred with this anti-Americanism. Yeah, anti-Americanism is a very interesting concept. It o it's a concept that only exists in totalitarian states. So for example, if uh, someone in Italy, let's say, is uh, criticizing the Berlusconi government, they're not accused of being anti-Italian. Uh, in the Soviet Union, old Soviet Union, uh, you could be condemned for being anti-Soviet. In the uh, Brazilian military dictatorship, you could be uh, anti-Brazilian. But aside from the United States, I don't know of any other uh, non-totalitarian, non-authoritarian country where the concept even exists. It's a very striking country concept. If you're critical of policy, you're anti-American. Actually, this has an interesting biblical origin. Uh, the first use of this concept is actually uh, uh, by King Ahab, who was the ultimate the king of ultimate evil in the Bible. He called the prophet Isaiah, uh, Elijah to him and asked him uh, why he is a hater of Israel, mm -hmm. meaning condemning the acts of the evil king. That's basic concept. Authority, if you challenge authority, you're opposed to the society, the culture, you know, the community, and so on. And we, and we see that with Trump. And, and we'll come back in a moment uh, with our conversation with Professor Noam Chomsky. It's called the feeling of freedom. Everyone in the world should experience freedom and you get it on the open road. The world according to Jesse. Welcome to my world. Come along for the ride. Redacted Tonight is a comedy news show that is not defanged by the corporate media. We can go after the corporations that destroy our lives, profit over people at every turn. The Redacted Tonight for me is like medicine. It's like an antidote from all the stress that the news puts you under. Redacted Tonight is a show where you can go to cry from laughing about the stuff that's going on in the world, as opposed to just regular crying. We're going to find out what the corporate mainstream media is not telling you about, and we're going to filter it through some satirical comedic lenses to make it more digestible. That's what we do every week. Hard-hitting, radical comedy news like Redacted Tonight is where it's at. To the war hawks selling you on the idea that dropping bombs brings peace, to the chicken hawks forcing you to fight in the battles that they start. The news hawks try to tell you that celebrity gossip and tabloid murder trials are the most important news of the day. While the hawks of advertising tell you that you are not cool enough unless you buy their product. Watching the hawks, watching the hawks. These are the hawks that we, along with our audience, will be watching.
welcome back to our conversation with Professor Noam Chomsky. So let's talk about principle number three, redesign the economy. Um, I suppose this would have taken off, would you say, in the 1970s? Late, I think, began in the 70s. You see the first steps in the late Carter administration, then Reagan and Thatcher. And what were they doing? What did you see? Well, this is the so-called neoliberal shift to try to shift decisions from the public arena to what's called the market, the market. How do you define neoliberalism? It's basically the idea is privatize, uh, reduce the role of the public institutions, uh, uh, deregulate, uh, 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 permit the, in fact, encourage the growth of financial institutions, uh, a network of policies of this kind. Uh, the ideology claims it's increasing freedom. It's actually increasing tyranny. It means that instead of decisions and choices being made in the public arena where the public in principle has some kind of role into the state to the uh, degree that the state is democratic, maybe an actual role, shifting it to private tyrannies, corporate sector, mostly pretty highly monopolized uh, oligopoly. And that's when you get this imbalance between what you talk about, the manufacturing sector and the financial sector. You also have enormous growth of the financial sector. So if you go to the 50s and 60s, the regulated capitalism period, banks were basically banks, you know, put your money in them, they lent to people to start a business, something like that. Uh, from the early 70s, it shifted dramatically uh, to uh, uh, speculate, a huge increase in speculation, uh, complex uh, financial instruments. Uh, by 2007, before the latest of the crashes for which the financial sector was mostly responsible, uh, they actually had 40% of corporate And profits. this is an economy where essentially you make money by manipulating money. money. A, lot, a shift in that degree, actually, the, in the 1990s is when the decline of the manufacturing sector really began. It, uh, and this was specific policy. It's a combination of trade policy and fiscal policy. Uh, go into the details, but that essentially was the high dollar policy, the uh, way in which the so-called free trade, not free trade uh, agreements were structured, uh, led to these effects. Uh, this is all part of the same system, and it's had consequences. One <clears throat> consequence is that for the majority of the population, stagnation or decline. Uh, the uh, uh, take a look at real wages there. Well, well, you, we should just talk, that you speak about this, these free trade agreements in essence pushed the plight of the American worker downward yeah. because they had to be competitive with sweatshop workers in yeah, China. But, uh, that it was uh, putting the working people of the world in competition, right. but not, but allowing freedom of capital and in fact high protection for capital. These are not free trade agreements. So the uh, uh, what's called intellectual property rights is just a huge tax on the population. It's massive increase in the uh, patent rights, which had never existed before. So it means that uh, you know a Microsoft monopoly can't be challenged. Uh, mega corporations have extraordinary rights, and uh, uh, the effect of this is uh, it's it's like a extremely high tariff is what it amounts to. Well, you to. talk about how workers can't move, but capital can. Yeah, that's and that the whole uh, capitalism itself, if you go back to Adam Smith, is based on the free circulation of labor. That that's, that's the foundation of that's a free trade. Adam Smith, but there's nothing like that. Right. Quite the opposite. Let, let yeah. me ask about that this was, this created worker insecurity by design. Yes, and in fact, uh, the phrase growing worker insecurity is Alan Greenspan's uh, the kind of uh, running, managing the system as fed, head of the Fed. But when he was testifying to Congress on the uh, success of the economy he was running, he attributed a large part of it to what he called growing worker insecurity. Which he saw as a good thing. 
that's the implication, right. you know, because it keeps right. wages down, it keeps people, workers for asking for benefits, it keeps inflation low, and it breaks units, and it keeps profits high, and it makes that's, it very hard to organize. And uh, he points out intelligently that this growing worker insecurity is so extreme that even when unemployment is down, as it was in the late Clinton years, still uh, the same conditions apply. Workers are just afraid. Unions are being destroyed. Uh, and this is part of the what was called the great moderation the success by economists, the success of the neoliberal programs, which had the effect that, uh, say, by 2007, before the crash, uh, real wages were actually lower than they had been in 1979 when the neoliberal experiment began. That's a very sharp change. For, actually, one index of the change, which is interesting, is just taking a look at minimum wage, which sets a kind of floor for wages. During the first period, regulated capitalism, uh, minimum wage tracked productivity, which would be expected. It breaks in the 1970s. Productivity and growth go up more slowly, but somewhat. Minimum wage stays flat, which means it actually reduces. If minimum wage had continued today, it would probably be something like $20 an right. hour. And that's an indic just like the actual reduction in real wages. That's an indication of the nature of these highly praised socioeconomic policies. Another effect uh, was deregulation. Uh, starts with it started actually in late Carter, but picked up with Reagan and extended under Clinton. Uh, that for financial, and that meant the beginning of, of crashes. In the 50s and 60s, there were no financial right. crashes. You had uh, New Deal regulation. Starting in the 80s, you start getting crash after crash, each one worse than the last. Uh, public bails them out. Uh, and uh, you know that's the nature of the system. Let, let, me, let me move on to shifting the burden is another shifting the burden uh, so that the uh, oligarchic elites, I mean, especially Fortune 500 companies, are not paying taxes. And, and, and more of the responsibility for funding the nation falls on the backs of the working poor. Actually, there's been a very sharp reduction in taxation of the wealthy since uh, the 50s and the 50s and 60s right through the neoliberal period and all sorts of other devices have been developed so that uh, corp the corporate sector can avoid taxes so say take the biggest uh, company in the world apple hugely profitable uh, they have a, an office somewhere in ireland uh, which is uh, allegedly where they're based of course they're based this is here. the offshoring that's the right. offshore base. They were just fined, I think, something like $13 billion or something like that by the European Union for tax evasion there. But it means they're not paying it here. And there's a lot of complaints from business, of course, about the high corporate tax. If you look at the effective corporate tax, what they actually pay, it's far lower. This is, gives rise to what you call the precariat. The precariat is the growing worker insecurity, the fact that you don't have the security of a stable job, which is going to be continuing work, which is going to be a guaranteed pension, a chance for your children to go to college. Uh, that's radically and, disappearing. And you said that this system, to quote, we're headed towards a cliff. It's headed towards a cliff in many ways. Uh, the worst cliff that we're heading towards is due to market systems. There's a fundamental flaw in markets. We have a very limited market. There's massive state intervention, but it's, to some extent, market principles prevail. In a market, you don't pay attention to externalities, to the effect of your transactions on others. So if I sell you a car, we make a good deal for ourselves, but we don't pay attention to the fact that there's another car on the street, there's more congestion, uh, more accidents, uh, more pollution, others suffer. Now there's one, ex if, if Goldman Sachs makes a risky transaction, if they're paying attention, they 
cover the risk to themselves. What but, they did with subprime mortgages. But they don't pay attention to what's called systemic risk, right. that the whole system may collapse. That's the public's problem. Well, and climate change is perhaps... But now we have climate change. Right. That's an externality which is going to destroy us unless something's done. And the position of the savage wing of American capitalism, the Republican Party, is quite striking. They are really racing towards a precipice. Haven't you called them the most dangerous organization in world history? Was that the right? I think that's, as, as I pointed out, that's an outrageous statement. But the question is, is it true? Has there ever been an organization in history which has dedicated itself to destruction of the possibility of organized human life? That's actually what we're facing. And they're pretty remarkable. And the Trump administration has accelerated. They've accelerated it, but they're, riding, they're at the peak of a Republican Party shift. Take a look at the last primaries. Every single candidate in the Republican primary either flatly denied that climate change is happening uh, or else said maybe it is, but we don't have to do anything about it. 100% denialism. The Paris uh, negotiations in this concluded in December 2015 were intended to reach a verifiable treaty. Uh, they couldn't and had to just keep to promises because the Republican Congress wouldn't permit it. They were, by now, uh, November 8th, uh, last November 8th, the U.S. just basically pulled out. It's now isolated in the world, literally isolated in racing toward the precipice while the rest of the world is trying to do something, not enough, but at least something to deal with the problem. Right, thanks. That was Professor Noam Chomsky. Thank you for watching. Join us next week for part two with our conversation with Professor Noam Chomsky. You can find us on rt.com slash on contact. Until next week.